If your mother's sister is really, really cold, you might call her antifreeze. Antifreeze is what you add to your car's engine to get the water coolant in it to either boil at a higher temperature or freeze at a lower temperature. Now why would you want to do that? Your car's engine's got a lot of moving parts. The moving parts that rub close to each other generate friction, and friction generates heat. So what you need to do is pass water through your car's engine, and that water will carry away the heat that the engine produces, so your car doesn't overheat, break down the oil and all the rest of that. But water is a liquid at a very limited range of temperatures. It's a liquid from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Now in the winter, it can get a lot colder than the freezing point of water. So we put antifreeze in and it prevents the water from freezing until it gets to a much colder temperature. In the summer, it gets really, really hot. The car's engine can actually get above 100 degrees Celsius, above the boiling point. Boiling water isn't going to do you any good because if water boils in your engine, well, the extra gas is going to exert pressure and you're going to blow some gaskets and it's just terrible at carrying heat away from the engine. So what we do is we put in some antifreeze and the antifreeze raises the boiling point of the water so that it doesn't boil to a much hotter temperature and can continue carrying heat away from your car's engine. This is why we put salt on the roads in the winter time. You also put it on walkways to melt ice. Not only does it melt the ice, but once it gets in, once it dissolves into the melted water, it's going to prevent that ice from refreezing. Now, it's not perfect at this. If you get it cold enough, you can still refreeze it. But the point is, this brings the freezing point down. So even if it's really, really cold below freezing, it's still going to stay a liquid and not freeze. These are what we call colligative properties. They're properties of a solution that are affected by concentration. Boiling point which increases as you put more stuff in, and freezing point, which decreases as you put more stuff in. Boiling point, elevation. Freezing point, depression. Widening the range of temperatures where water is liquid. This is the label on the back of the antifreeze container. If you know what your cooling system capacity is, it tells you how many quarts of antifreeze to put in to protect your car's engine down to what temperature. So if you only need to protect, let's say you've got a 10 quart cooling system and you need to protect your car's engine down to about minus 20 degrees. Minus 34 protection, you've got to put in 5 quarts of antifreeze into your 10 quart system. In other words, 50% of your cooling system needs to be antifreeze. Now you never put pure antifreeze in alone. You've got to have water in there as your coolant. Antifreeze doesn't do a good job of carrying away heat. All it does is preventing the water coolant from freezing. As you can see, the more quarts of antifreeze you put in, the more it lowers the freezing point. As you increase the amount of antifreeze in your car's engine, it brings the freezing point down and it brings the boiling point up. Going from 33 and a third percent to 60 percent will protect you from zero degrees Celsius down to minus 62. So that is a 62 degree difference in how much it protects. But for the boiling point, you're only going from 256 to 270. That's only a 14 degree difference. Antifreeze is much more effective at preventing water from freezing than it is from preventing water from boiling. Therefore, antifreeze is what it's called. The more particles you have in solution, the greater the effect is going to be on the melting point and boiling point. Ionic compounds break up into individual ions. Ionic compounds are made of positive and ions that are stuck together because of mutual attraction. But water molecules can be attracted to these ions also. And as they move, they pull the ions apart, breaking the ionic bond. Therefore, one mole of ionic substance can break up into two moles of ions. These ions are free to move around and carry their electrical charge with them. That means they conduct electricity. They're called electrolytes. The ionic compounds that ionize in water turn into ions and conduct electricity due to the freely moving charged particles. This is why you're able to move. You see, devices that we use use wires to carry electric current in the form of moving electrons. 
but we don't have wires in us, unless of course you're a robot. And if you're a robot, you probably don't need to be taking this class because all you have to do is you like just program yourself and it'll be all good. We don't use electricity in the form of moving electrons. What we have are ions that move through our muscles, our nerves, anything that moves, anything that carries a signal. This is why if you hit your hand, it takes a moment for your brain to realize it because the pain is not being transmitted nearly at the speed of light like with a wire, but it's being transmitted chemically, neuron to neuron, with electrolyte signals until it gets to your brain. This is why your reaction is slower than if you were actually a robot. Then again, robots can't self-heal. We can. Sodium chloride dissolves in water to form sodium ions and chloride ions. Calcium bromide dissolves in water to form calcium ion plus two bromide ions. The two ions separate. CaBr2. When you break it up, you get two bromide ions and one calcium ion. AlF3, aluminum fluoride, breaks up to form an aluminum ion plus three fluoride ions. AlF3. Dissolve that in water, you're going to get one aluminum ion and three fluoride ions. Calcium nitrate will break up to form a calcium ion plus two nitrate ions. Calcium ion, two nitrate ions, CaNO32, CaNO32. Break it up, one calcium, two nitrates. Al2SO43, aluminum sulfate, breaks up to form two aluminum ions plus three sulfate ions. Al2SO43, put this in water and you're going to get two separate Al's, two Al's, and one, two, three, three sulfate ions. So one mole of sodium chloride will break up into two moles of ions. One mole of calcium bromide will break up into one plus two is three moles of ions. One mole of aluminum fluoride will break up to form one plus three is four moles of ions. One mole of calcium nitrate will break up to form one plus two is three moles of ions. One mole of aluminum sulfate will break up to two plus three equals five moles of ions. Which of these is going to have the greatest impact on the melting and boiling point? Whichever one gives you the most particles. This one's going to have the highest boiling point and the lowest melting point. Freezing point, melting point, same deal. Whichever one breaks up into the fewest particles is going to have the lowest boiling point and the highest freezing point. More particles, greater effect, greater range that water's a liquid. Fewer particles, least effect, smaller the difference between the melting and boiling point. Non-electrolytes are made of molecules that don't ionize in water. Here's a polar molecule. Here's an ionic compound. Water molecule has no problem tearing apart the ions because they're only attracted at the surface. No matter how hard water tries, it can't break that covalent bond that holds the molecule together. So it carries it off as one piece. These are called non-electrolytes. They don't break up any further when you put them in water. They don't ionize and they don't conduct electricity. How do you know if it's molecular? Non-metals only. C12H22O11 will stay C12H22O11. None of the bonds will break. You're just going to separate the molecules from each other. This is a molecule of antifreeze, also known as ethylene glycol, also known as 1,2-ethyl diol. When this dissolves in water, no bonds break. 